Are we are, are you getting the holding slide up as well, Michelle? Mm -hmm. Yep. Let's go. So I'm still going to wait about 20 seconds, OK? Good morning and welcome to the Meet Your Future campaign. My name is Laura and I'm part of the Bridge team at Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Meet Your Future was launched in April 2019 to enable more young people like you to meet with and have meaningful conversations with employers whilst experiencing different workplaces. Over the last 12 months, we have been speaking with young people from all 10 local authorities in Greater Manchester to find out how you've been feeling, how you feel you should be supported now and into your future. We have been listening and we have learned a lot. We have developed a suite of information, resources and services that are there to help you. This can be found on GMAX. I'll pop that link into the chat box in a moment, which many of you are probably already familiar with please speak to your teacher to find out more. We have also ad adapted the Meet Your Future campaign to better fit what you have been telling us. Throughout this academic year, you will be able to join sessions and chat with Greater Manchester and national employers about growth sectors across Greater Manchester, different pathways and the vast array of careers and opportunities that are available to you in the future right here in Greater Manchester. In this session, you will hear from Anne Parks, a social value consultant from Arup, all about sustainability in the built environment. Hopefully, this session will inform you, inspire you, and show you why you should be hopeful and optimistic about your future in Greater Manchester. Throughout the session, please make use of the question box for questions, and we'll cover these at the Q&A section at the end. If you would like to use captions or subtitles during the event, please select captions subtitles on in your video controls. I'm now delighted to introduce Anne for this morning's session. Thank you, Laura, for um, that kind introduction. Next slide, please. Oops. So my name is Anne Parks and I'm a social value associate at Arup and I'll come on to explain a bit about social value and a bit about Arup as we go through this morning's presentation. I'm going to talk about sustainability in the built environment but before I start I just thought I'd explain the choice of picture on this slide. This is our new office um, block in London. Um, it's a real example of sustainability in the built environment. It's an all electric building, which means we have no reliance on gas for heating, which reduces our carbon emissions. And it sources its electric um, power from renewable energy sources, again, making it um, compliant in terms of net zero carbon and looking at our carbon emissions. It's designed to meet a change in people, in, in social and people's requirements of office space to enable more flexible working in the post-pandemic uh, environment. So it's thought about people and social sustainability in its design. And the image here is of the roof garden. So green space on top of the roof which enables us to be greener in terms of biodiversity and the natural environment, but also considers staff and visitor well-being in the design and use of the office building. And we'll talk more about all of those elements as we go through the presentation. Next slide, please. So who are Arup? We are a global firm of engineers, designers and planners. So although you won't see us out in the built environment as much as maybe construction companies who are actually building buildings or um, designing and delivering roads or building the next railway, we're behind the scenes doing the designs, checking the, um, the conditions of the ground that we might be um, needing to dig into 
and uh, looking at planning permission for the many buildings that go up in and around our cities and towns. We're known as a multidisciplinary team and we have 16,000 people working across the globe including in 17 offices across the UK. So real opportunity as an employer, a big employer in the local area and, and globally, which allows our staff actually to move between offices and, and move between countries, which is really an exciting opportunity. Um, sustainability is absolutely at the heart of our business. We can make a real difference to the environment and to communities that we build and deliver projects in. And it's really important that we practice what we preach. So we've set a goal to be net zero and think about our carbon emissions by the year 2030. Um, and that means that by 2025, we need to reduce our carbon emissions by 30% which is a significant challenge. And lots of businesses in the built environment are thinking in this way right now. And to give you a feel for the size and the complexity of that, that's the same sort of carbon emissions that 16 and a half thousand homes in the UK would emit each year. So it's kind of like dealing with a small town or, or a large village in terms of complexity and scale. Next slide, please. So we may be global, but we're very much local as well. So in terms of um, things that you might be aware of or might have even uh, been to or seen that we've been involved in in the Greater Manchester area. We've been working in Manchester for 60 years and we have 400 staff in our Piccadilly office right next to Piccadilly station. So we're really local too and we employ lots of local people. 85% of people who are are in our office commute from within Greater Manchester. And here is just some images of projects you might be aware of. So we redesigned and did all the civil engineering for St Peter's Square with the extra Metrolink crossing. Um, and you may have noticed the really large, beautiful, mature trees that are now in place in, in St Peter's Square. And um, they always look brilliant at this time of year because they've got fantastic purple blossoms. So I'd really recommend looking at it. But it was really challenging because we had to move the War Memorial, the Cenotaph, which obviously came with a huge amount of emotion and, and kind of social um, considerations to be to be had. We're currently renovating the town hall in the centre of the city. You may have noticed that it's closed at the moment and um, that's to really help with the ongoing sustainability of a major listed building in our in our area to make sure that that building built hundreds of years ago actually can continue to operate safely and um, in a nice environment with um, good heating, um, good air conditioning and air controls um, that weren't built when it was built in, um, in the Victorian period. We're also working um, on stations and railway lines around uh, Staley Bridge out of Manchester through to Leeds on what's called the Trans Pennine route upgrade. So we're not just about buildings and we're not just about public spaces. We're also about railways and um, looking to improve the efficiency and the speed of the line between Manchester and Leeds to help commuters um, and help improve the economy of the north of England. You'll have heard a lot about levelling up um, and uh, the impact of levelling up in the north. Well, actually, rail and commuting and transport is key to that and making that more efficient. So huge amount of work going on on railways. And the final image, which is not brilliant quality, so I, I apologise for that, but that's the, North, that's the North Manchester General Hospital site. So that's the site of a previous hospital that's been completely redeveloped to provide affordable housing for people in the local area, to provide better, higher quality healthcare in a modern setting, but also to provide community facilities and, as you can see, some better public realms, so um, some nice green spaces that can be used by the local community, really bringing environmental, social um, and economic benefits all together on one site. So that's us in Manchester. Just um, a, a 
really just me, I suppose. I um, I thought it'd be useful to share my route into sustainability. So these images are very old and you can tell because uh, I've actually had to take a photo on my phone of real photos, which are very rarely printed out these days. Um, and this is a, a project in Chile in South America. And I um, took a gap year when I was 30. So um, some of you might be thinking about taking gap years after school. Well, I took one much later in my career and it opened up my eyes to sustainability. I was working with an organisation called Operation Rally, supporting young people from the UK and from South America to gain new skills by being away from home, um, getting involved in different projects across Chile. And in particular, in this case, we were building a community centre for a remote farming village in Chile where they didn't have medical facilities or a place where the community could come together. And we lived sustainably for three or four months, camping on the land in the village and supporting the farmers with extra bits of work around their farms, including milking their cows um, and having breakfast with the farmers in the morning. So it was a real eye opener to sustainability and it gave me the, the, the wish and the passion to get involved in that at a more local level on my return. Um, but it was also brilliant to see the young people that joined us gaining all those new skills um, from that experience as well. So that's how I came to work in this sector. Next slide, please. So what is sustainability? Well, in its simplest form, we think about sustainability in three ways. Next slide. The first is environmental. And that's the one that most people really think about. They think about global warming, climate change, and you'll have seen marches around um, on television, campaigns around on television, um, Extinction Rebellion. You know, it's very high profile in um, social media and in, um, the, in the public space, in the public realm. And it's really important that we do something um, to look at the way that we use our natural resources to minimise deforestation, um, to think about how we reuse materials in the built environment. So if a building does need to be demolished, can we use the waste materials in a different project so that we reduce the amount of materials going to landfill, for example? So the environmental element of sustainability is um, is always first and foremost in people's minds, but it has two other areas that we focus on. The next is economic. So how can we ensure that communities and, and places are sustainable from an economic perspective? How can we make sure that businesses thrive and that people are encouraged to to start up new businesses and get the support that they need? How can we ensure that we are equal and we think about inclusion and equality in terms of people's um, prospects, in terms of jobs and skills? So for example, in Greater Manchester, a really amazing initiative that you might want to think more about and, and look into is Greater Manchester's Good Employment Charter. It's something that Arabs signed up to and many businesses have. And it's all about encouraging businesses like ours to take a fair approach to our employment, offering good training opportunities, thinking about op opening up our opportunities to local people um, and making sure that people who work for us, we consider their health and well-being and we consider their, um, their future prospects so that it's a sustainable role and it gives them a sustainable career that then helps neighbourhoods and communities to prosper. The final element is the social element of sustainability and it's often said that the S in sustainability, the social bit, is the forgotten bit. This is about making sure that we have vibrant and diverse and safe, strong communities. And the built environment can make a massive impact on that. 
whether it's access to green space to help people to be um, be healthier or have better mental health and well-being or whether it's easy access into employment centres or the opportunity for active travel, so cycling and walking that might help their health and health and well-being, or whether it is just um, easy access to digital um, skills um, or digital spaces um, or the support they need around that. So what we think about in ARIT when we think about the social side of sustainability is that it's about making sure that all of our projects will lead to better quality of life for the local people that are impacted by those projects. And in doing that, that we hope to improve their health and well-being. So that is what we think about in terms of sustainability. Next slide, please. Another area you might want to do some investigation into after this talk, if you're interested in this topic, is the UN SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals. These were developed um, in the last decade and all the countries within the UN signed up to a charter around the UN SDGs. And they're all around these 17 goals to transform our world. And they drive a lot of what we're doing globally. And they're a good way of measuring um, projects in the built environment and the impact that we can have. So we can report whether a particular project has had an impact in relation to one of these 17 goals. And as you'll see, they're a really good summary of whether it they're environmentally focused, economically focused or socially focused. So those three principles of sustainability from the first goal being about eradicating poverty and having that equality so that no, no family or no person should be experiencing food or fuel poverty, for example, which is very prevalent in the news at the moment with energy price increases through to um, number eight, which is around making sure that people have access to decent work and that there is strong economic growth within a community, again, on the economic side. But then on the um, environmental side, that might be around um, number 12, which is about responsible consumption and production. So making sure that we consume resources whether that's food, whether that's um, wood for materials, um, whether that's minerals that we might need in things like cement, whether we're consuming those responsibly, using them responsibly um, and thinking about how we produce them and the impact of that production on our environment and on our world around us. So, as I say, there's a there's a link there to the website for the UN SDGs, and I'd really recommend you having a look if it's something that you're interested in. Next slide, please. More locally at home, um, the UK Green Building Council, which is very, it, it's basically a lobbying um, and industry organisation that supports organisations in the built environment in the UK. They described sustainability in the following ways, and I thought it was just worth going through each of these five um, areas just to help you understand a bit more about what we think about when we think about sustainability in our projects every day. So we've talked a bit about the fact that we want to mitigate and adapt to climate change. So we either want to reduce um, and make a positive impact in relation to climate change by making our buildings net zero or potentially using less concrete, for example, which can be quite detrimental to the environment um, in, our, in our projects. But we might also need to adapt to climate change. And this is about helping communities become uh, more resilient to the impacts of climate change. So in the UK, flooding is a really good example of where we need to adapt. We know that there are more flood events than there have ever been before. And one of the things that Arup's doing at the moment is working with the Environment Agency in Yorkshire to look at how we 
um, work with communities like Hebden Bridge or Walsden, where they are um, more likely to be impacted by um, climate events now that the rivers um, have um, extreme flooding events more frequently. We um, also look at how we maximise resource efficiency. So that's a very complicated term and you may have heard of circular economy. But what this is all about is about eliminating waste and particularly thinking about waste to landfill, as I've talked about earlier. That's about saying if we are going to remove something during one of our projects, can that be can that waste be an important product for somebody else to use or a different business to use in a different project so that what is waste to us could actually be um, a useful um, ingredient or um, a, um, component for some somebody else to use in a positive way and hence we reduce our effect on on the landscape around us. Embracing and restoring nature and promoting biodiversity. So that might be really small things in a building setting, for example, about having bee um, beehives on roofs in cities. So there's a huge um, focus at the moment around thinking about um, small things that people can do that are easy to do but make a difference. So um, cities are really thinking about how they green their buildings. And you may have seen living walls on high rise buildings, certainly um, roof, green roofs um, to hold water and um, act as a bit of a biodiversity reservoir are increasingly um, seen in the built environment. And all of those things um, help to optimise the health and well-being of people and create long term value for society and improving quality of life. And one of the projects I'm going to come on and talk a little bit about in a minute is really focused around health and well-being at its heart, but in doing so will also improve our environment. Next slide, please. So this project, I'm just going to go through a few examples to try and bring some of this to life. But we've been working and this is a London project, so I apologise it isn't a Manchester project, but I've been doing quite a lot of work with the British Library, which is a national institution that houses a copy of every single book that is published. And I didn't know that before I worked on this project. So you find out all sorts of things when you work um, with Arup. Um, but um, so the British Library houses um, millions of books, um, but needs to expand. So we're working on a project called the British Library Extension, which will be an extension to the library facility as well as developing commercial space. But in doing that, they've really thought about the sustainability of this um, extended building. So again, the planning for it to be an all electric um, building so that it will reduce its carbon emissions because it won't be using gas um, or, or petroleum based fuels um, to fuel um, the heating or the air conditioning or the, um, the air quality within the building. It's also looking at rainwater harvesting so that there is um, again, that thinking about capturing natural resources, minimising waste and also helping with runoff into um, into busy, into a busy central London um, area. The whole project, the whole of the commercial space of the building has been pushed back away from the road in relation to its original design to enable um, green space to be put right at the front of the building. This is partly to ensure that for the local community that lives around there, they see a much more pleasant natural environment are in, and are encouraged to come and use that open space that will be open to the public. So there's a health and wellbeing benefit there. But even more than that, a whole area of that green space is being designated as a community garden and will be managed um, by a local a voluntary sector um, charity 
um, and will be maintained and managed by local community members who will learn about growing vegetables. So there's a real, it, it brings a new resource um, and a new asset to that local community. In addition, the foyer in, in the new building for the library will be open for the public to meet. So it will be open as a community venue and will be able to use be used even when the library is closed. And um, there's going to be um, so, uh, some of the workspace within the building is going to be uh, at a reduced rent to encourage local businesses to um, use that if they want to think about starting up a new business or running their business from that space. So it will just help to bring some of that economic growth into the area and encourage entrepreneurs and, and young people with ideas to be able to more affordably um, set up that business. Um, and in terms of education and schools, there's a whole program of support being put in place to encourage young people from um, neighbouring schools to come in and use the British Library, including free Wi-Fi for those that might struggle at home in terms of having a computer or, or a computer that they're not sharing with a brother or sister, um, and also those that might not be able to afford um, broadband at home can come in and use the library um, to do some of that studying. So again, more benefits for the local community. So hopefully that gives you a flavour of how a new building and a new space can think more than just about its fundamental first purpose of being a commercial space, but can actually bring much wider benefits to the community. Next slide, please. The image on the right is actually an image we used for COP26, which was a big um, international conference that happened last year um, up in Glasgow. You may well have heard about it. And it was all about get, getting uh, all the countries in the world to sign up to some stronger targets around climate change and sustainability. And Arab were the advisors to the government around developing um, COP26 around sustainability. So it's, it gives you another perspective on the type of work that a business like Arup does. It's not just about designing new buildings or new spaces, but actually we also advise and provide advisory services to the government or to local authorities or to other private sector businesses. And the reason I put this image in is that in Manchester, in Greater Manchester at the moment, you may have heard or you may have seen some of the signage, but we have a clean air project um, currently in development. And the and one of the drivers for greening cities, as you see in this image, is that we um, by doing so, we clean the air, we, we reduce air pollution um, and we also reduce the heat island effect, but we can reduce the pollution in the air. And um, the Clean Air Project in Greater Manchester, just a really good example of the kind of advisory work that a business like Arup can give to um, cities like Greater Manchester. So we're working with Transport for Greater Manchester to look at the best way to reduce um, nitrogen dioxide levels in the air in Greater Manchester, which we think are um, responsible for thousands of deaths per year in the Greater Manchester area. So it's really important from a social sustainability and a health and well-being perspective that we bring those nitrogen dioxide levels down and they're due to um, pr primarily due to emissions from um, polluting vehicles. So we're looking at how we can work with um, road users, um, and work with um, businesses in the Greater Manchester area to encourage cleaner vehicles, different modes of transport um, in order to and support them to upgrade maybe to electric vehicles or to um, less polluting vehicles so maybe some hybrid vehicles. So looking at that in order to primarily improve the health and well-being of our 
um, cities, but at the same time provide environmental benefits. So that's another type of project that we've been working on and that you'll see around Greater Manchester because you will have seen um, some signs up around the clean air zone, I'm sure. Next slide, please. And then the other kind of work that I thought would be useful and thinks more about, again, around a mix of sustainability from a social perspective, but also from um, an environmental perspective. Um, we do a lot of research and lots of organisations like ours do um, thought, what we call thought leadership. So really trying to think what are the next big challenges going on in the world and how can we help to, um, to solve them, to put forward recommendations? How can we advise governments and city um, mayors, for example? And these are just two example reports. So thinking about how we design the, a, a city or a place for aging communities. The population is aging. Um, and um, and that's happening globally across the world um, and family dynamics have changed. So older people in some societies get less support from their family than they may have previously. So how do we design cities that work for older people? But also, how do we design cities if we want to encourage people not to drive so that our air is cleaner? How do we ensure that um, active travel which is walking or cycling or, or, or even um, using elements of public transport, how do we ensure that they're truly inclusive, that we break down the barriers that stop people from doing that, whether that's because you're disabled um, or whether that's because you come from a culture where cycling isn't the norm or, it, or you don't feel safe um, in that environment. So we have t a team in Arup, for example, who are the inclusive environment team, and they they are skilled in thinking about how do we ensure that the spaces, the places that we're creating and advising on are truly inclusive for everyone in society. Next slide, please. So hopefully I've given you a bit of a taste of the three elements of sustainability, we could talk about it all day. There's plenty of information about different projects that Arup have done on Arup's website, which is really simple, www.arup.com. So please feel free to go and have a look. But I thought it might be useful just to talk about careers in Arup before we hand over to you to have a bit of a think about what you think sustainability means to you. Next slide, please. Arup is a large um, early careers uh, recruiter and every year we recruit apprentices, graduates and internships into every one of our offices in the UK and this might be something that you would be interested in thinking about. So um, internships tend to be for people who are um, at um, university and have the summer off and may wish to get work experience ahead of making an application for a job or just to gain broader life skills and, and work experience skills before they decide what route they want to go down. But we do offer some internships for those in sixth form um, who um, have you know, a clear interest in, in a field. Um, we have annual recruitment into our apprenticeship um, and graduate scheme and I've just put the website address on this slide for those that might want to just have a look at the types of roles but they tend to be into um, all um, into all of our teams so whether that's um, apprentices in our planning team um, or people um, CAD technicians working with our civil engineering department um, you know, gaining experience as a as a qualified CAD technician um, or people entering as engineering or building apprentices. Um, we have a wide range of, of options available, so it is worth looking. I've just I've just focused on apprenticeships for today and the next slide 
just takes you through the timeline so that if it's something you're interested in and many businesses will follow a similar approach um, our apprenticeship um, opportunities normally open in October so they're closed now and we've finished our um, recruitment process for this year but for next year for um, starting in September 23 for example our application process would open in October and um, then we run virtual assessment centres and interviews from January through to about um, about now so we're just finishing this year and offers start to be made um, from February for a September start. So if this is a route that you're interested in and they are at many levels, um, then um, you know, please look on the website and, and at the end of this, you'll be given a route to be able to drop me a line um, via Laura and I'd be very happy to answer any questions or put you in touch with the early careers team at Arup. But now it's over to you. We're going to have a break in a minute and, um, and ask you to have a, a think amongst yourselves. Um, so thinking about the environment that you and your school are in. So thinking about the environment and community surrounding your school. What are the three key things you think are opportunities to improve sustainability through the built environment around you? So there's no wrong or right answer because there's probably a very long list of things that could be done to improve um, sustainability in your local built environment but you might have three that really stick out to you. And it'd be interesting to discuss why you think those are the, are the key ones from your perspective. But remember to consider social, economic and environmental. You might think it, you know, you may feel that it's all the environmental factors that are the key ones, but don't forget the social and, and economic because that will give you a much more rounded um, picture of why that is important. So if you want to, we're going to have a short break now. Um, and if you can consider those in small groups or in pairs, that would be great. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Anne, for introducing that task. It's 10.37 now, so we'll come back on talking at about 10.41, so we've got four minutes to discuss and we'll speak to you again shortly.
just one minute left until we rejoin. Can I remind everybody that you can post questions in the chat box as well? Great, welcome back everybody. I hope you've all had a chat there um, about that task and thank you for introducing it. Um, as it shows on the next slide, you can submit your ideas to us on email. There's our team email there and we will forward that on to Anne to share her feedback with you. So it's now, now time for the question and answer session and I will just read some of these out now, Anne. So Anne talked about her own journey to working in sustainability with your gap year in Chile. Uh, what other sorts of backgrounds do your colleagues have and what pathways are usual to working in sustainability? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's a, because we are uh, what we call a multidisciplinary team, we do have a lot of different pathways into um, into this work. So I'll just touch on a few of them. Um, so many of uh, my colleagues have um, geography qualifications, so they've used geography as a route into um, sustainability as it does cover the human aspect around international development um, and population as well as um, some of the more environmental factors in terms of natural habitat um, and managing the land. For those of you that are maybe doing geography GCSE I know that does contain um, you know, quite a lot around um, sustainability. Um, and then they've often gone on to do a master's qualification um, around sustainable development. So there's um, quite a few of those kind of courses in local universities around Leeds and, and Manchester. Um, but there are a wide number of people in the civil engineering team, which is the team that I'm based in, that have come through an apprenticeship, a, apprenticeship route, um, either as a civil engineer apprenticeship um, coming in from uh, GCSEs or A-levels and then doing their degree while they're actually um, training and learning and then go on to become chartered um, civil engineers or into that CAD technician role if if actually um, the IT, the computer and the design side, the and some people will come into sustainability through the economics route so doing courses um, uh, um, uh, probably at A level and then university around economics. Most people joining ARAT will join um, with a degree unless they come through from uh, the apprenticeship route. Brilliant, fantastic and that's really good to know for our young people tuning in today. Um, can we ask you another question? How does a company start to design a place like the British Library expansion and how do you influence the client to become more sustainable? Yeah, that's a, a very um, good question. So um, in terms of how we start um, to get involved with the client, um, that will be through uh, two probable routes. One will be through the development of a long term relationship um, with them. So that might be through years of working on other projects and becoming a preferred partner where e e the individual partners and the individual clients know each other really well and understand each other's ways of working. So it's a natural choice to then pick Arup 
to work with on that project. If we're working with the public sector in particular, um, so local authorities, councils or the government, then we would normally have to respond to a tender. So we'll be invited to, um, to, to, to say that we are interested in doing a piece of work and then putting forward our proposal for how we do it in a competitive setting. And then if we win it, then we go on to work with them. And at that point, we can then really start to influence how the project is delivered. It does depend on the client's outlook. So we were very lucky with British Library that Stanhope um, have embedded an environmental, social and governance strategy into their ways of working. And they really understand that if they are going to build buildings in London in particular, that um, businesses want to be based in, then they need to be building buildings for the future, ones that are future proof, that means they are very low carbon emission, that they're very comfortable for their staff and therefore actually influencing them to um, go for the highest standards of sustainable um, design is not as hard as you might think. Some, pe some clients are thinking more about cost, um, quality and cost, and therefore worry that adding sustainability in is going to add cost into the project. And that is then a case of um, demonstrating that perhaps design choices we might suggest don't cost more or could be balanced by some other element of the design further down the line. So it does vary massively by project, but we were very lucky with the British Library that we were all on the same page. That is so interesting. Thank you, Anne. And um, what do you think are the biggest barriers to proper environmental change at the moment? Yeah, it's quite interesting. So um, I think, and, and some of this will be my personal view, and some of it will be through Arab. Um, cost can be um, a barrier. I think the perception that sustainable um, choices cost more is definitely still an issue in the industry. And what we need are the case studies and the examples that show um, that either that isn't the case, that it doesn't have to be a choice between price and sustainability, um, or that in the long term, the value that developing a scheme sustainably brings in terms of um, being adapted for climate change so that you don't have to redo something in 10 years because it's already out of date and isn't isn't um, isn't adaptable to new climate change issues or you know that it's more attractive because it is a sustainable um, development and therefore more people want to use it and access it and um, so just finding the, the balance between price and cost now and long-term value of embedding sustainability in that those are real real challenges and then I think just consistency um, in it, consistency between um, different governments consistency between different local authorities in the standards that they are um, requiring. And there's a really big challenge at the moment if you think about what's going on in the world um, with, you know, everything in Ukraine, um, uh, uh, the post pandemic economic situation. We know that different governments are applying climate change um, um, factors in a different way. The developing world, you know, is really catching up in terms of its economic development and it wants to continue that growth and carbon emissions are very tied into that in terms of whether they use coal or gas and then developed countries want to do more around sustainability but look to those developing countries to say actually if you're not going to do it why should we and and so actually getting some consistency and have and being brave brave enough to be the the, 
the country and the place that says we're going to step up and we're going to do these things first. And we're going to be an exemplar. And I think Greater Manchester is really pushing to do that, pushing to be um, net zero, a net zero city. Um, you know, very early on in in the process, having declared a climate emergency some years ago. So, um, you know, it is doing its bit to try and move forward. Brilliant. Thank you, Anne. As we don't have any further questions in the chat box, I'll draw our talk to a close now. And um, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. That's been a really fascinating talk. And thank you to all the people that have tuned in as well. As we've said there, you can email your ideas for Anne's task to our team email. The email address is in the chat box now. You can keep up to date with all things Meet Your Future at GMAX as per the last slide that's on the screen now. You can follow us on Twitter at Your GMAX. And did you know you can watch our previous talks by checking out our YouTube channel from all sorts of interesting employers just like Anne. The link to that is also in the chat box now. For any teachers, parents or carers tuning in, I've also popped in into the chat box a link to a feedback form that we would love for you to complete on behalf of your students or children. Please take a moment to complete this as your feedback is so valuable to us. Thank you again for joining and we do hope to see you again soon. <laughs>